Hope you are fired up to be a revolutionary leader in this dark age that we live in. Look over at Matthew chapter 22. Jump into our Bible study today on an introductory course to revolutionary leaders. Matthew chapter 22. said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered the people they could find. Both good and bad, the wedding banquet hall was filled with guests, but when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked. How did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For there are many invited, but few are chosen. And the church said, Amen. you know, that's why you got to get here before 8 a.m. Because if not, the door gets locked. And you might be outside weeping with gnashing of teeth as the disciple who was knocking on the door past eight. You see, because once Jesus closes the door, that's it. There's no getting in. And so part of being a revolutionary leader is being on time. Because that's what it takes to get to heaven. you got to be on time. But as Jesus is there having the banquet hall for the kingdom of God, which if you're bound to on earth, you get bound to in heaven... He says there was a man who wasn't wearing wedding clothes. Now, it is said that at a lot of weddings, they would hand out wedding clothes at the door. <laughs> so really why this guy didn't have wedding clothes is because he didn't go through the front door. He tried to sneak in through the back. And so when he was questioned why he didn't wear wedding clothes, there was no excuse he could give. And so when you're questioned why you do not live out your purpose or why you did not fulfill your purpose for your destiny in this lifetime, you're going to be speechless because there's not going to be an excuse that you can give to God. No relationship, no career, no job, no possession is going to be worth it not fulfilling your destiny. Many are invited, but few are chosen. Do you believe that you've been chosen? No, no, I'm not just saying you believe you're a disciple and, and God chose to be... I'm saying you've been chosen to be a revolutionary leader. You've been chosen to be a leader in God's kingdom, in God's church. Do you really believe it? It's not an opinion of man. It's not because you have talents. It's not because you are very, very uh, intelligent and that you just know the Bible studies that we do. No, no. The reason you believe you're chosen is because God so ordained it. It is your destiny to be a leader in God's church. Do you believe it? There's a saying, uh, a man so thinketh in his heart, so is he. They also say you are what you eat. But I think for disciples, you are what you believe. Do you really believe that you've been chosen? That you are chosen not just to be an ordinary disciple, but in, in a way you are. What's an ordinary, regular disciple? Well, that's Jesus. <laughs> and you're called to be just like Jesus. You're called to be a revolutionary leader. Do you really believe that? It is your destiny. You see, I believe with everything that I am that I've been called to be a preacher. It's not because I have a church. It's not because I'm in the ministry. I believed it the day I got baptized. And so I became a preacher that day. When did you become a preacher? When did you become an evangelist or a woman's ministry leader? When did you become a revolutionary leader? Has it been when you got baptized, when you believed that you've been called and chosen by God? 
You see, God doesn't make mistakes. And he determines the exact time and place where you'll be. And you're here in this room for a reason. You're not here by chance. You're not here because you don't have anything else to do on a Saturday morning. You're here because you've been called by God to be a leader in his church. Do you believe it? Even with all your weaknesses. You see, look over in Galatians chapter 3. Some of you guys are already doubting on the first scripture right there. In Galatians chapter 3, another good verse for a uh, non-believer who doesn't believe in baptism. Verse 26, it says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You see, when you get baptized, you get the wedding clothes. You get to be at Jesus' table at the wedding banquet. Because you get to put Jesus Christ on at the waters of baptism. You get to be called, chosen, and faithful because you put your Jesus on when you got baptized. That's right. Do you believe that God set you apart even while you were still in the womb? Do you believe that you're chosen? You see, one of the biggest trouble for evangelists and women's ministry leaders in the kingdom of God is self-belief. They doubt themselves that they've been truly called. They look at their weaknesses, they look at their flaws, they look at their failures, they look at the lack of fruit in their lives, and they say, there's no way God has called me. And they doubt the very calling of God. How do you doubt the calling of God? You see, in order to be a revolutionary leader, you first got to believe it, that God has called you to be a leader in his kingdom. What have you believed that you're going to be an evangelist or a women's ministry leader? Or are you still doubting because you don't know the first principles. Because you haven't converted someone in Boston. Or you haven't converted someone into your personal ministry. You haven't met and baptized someone yet. And so you fail to accept that you've been called. you got to get that doubt out of your mind. You will always have failures. You will always have weaknesses. You will always have flaws. Every great person in the Bible who did anything for God except Jesus had sin. For all men have fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone sins. You see, God works with failures, just not quitters. Have you quit on the dream of being a revolutionary leader? Or do you believe it? With everything that you are. You could have people tell you they don't believe your ministry material. And you go, you know what? I don't care what you say. God is greater than man. And when God calls a man, he calls a man, and no one can deny it. Wow. Except yourself. June 21, you must remain in God's love. Have you remained in God's love in believing that you've been chosen? You clothe yourself with Christ, and so you get to be a revolutionary leader like Christ. Well, why did Jesus come to this earth? Number one, he came to die for you. Because no one else could die for you. He came to be that sacrificial lamb in order to die for your sins. But number two, why did he live a life for you? Look over at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. You guys have been called to be revolutionary leaders. Despite your weaknesses, despite your failures, to fight your character flaws, you've been called by God to be a leader in God's church. You first got to believe it. But you clothe yourself with Christ, and so we got to figure out what was Christ doing as a revolutionary leader. Well, number one, verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. First, you got to figure out who's saved and who's not. <laughs> And in order to save someone, you got to know how. Yeah. Do you know the first principles? Can you grab any Bible and take someone through the first principles? Or do you have to follow the scriptures that you wrote in your personal Bible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great training thing. I, I had a Bible with all the scriptures written in. But now I have a Bible with no notes. I can grab a Bible that's not NIV. 
I can grab any word of God and I can convert someone. Do you have that kind of faith? Because you know the passages that explain how to convert an atheist into a solid, soul out disciple. Jesus came to seek and save what was lost. He knew who was saved and he knew who was lost. Not according to his own standard, but according to the judge, the very word of God. Could you take someone through the first principles in the Old Testament? Some of you didn't even know you could do that. All the stuff that we teach in first principles is in the Old Testament. You can literally study with someone and baptize them and they'd be a faithful disciple just using the Old Testament if you wanted to. Wow. Baptism's there. The cross account, the passion account's there. Yeah. Seeking God is there. Mm -hmm. The Word of God is there as a standard. The kingdom is there. <laughs> Everything you need is right there. Is that pretty cool? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing we have the whole Bible, isn't it? <laughs> but could you do it? Are you here to seek and save what was lost? The second reason, well, the third reason, actually, Jesus came was Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. You see, because Jesus didn't just die for you, he lived a life for you. To set you an example of what you're supposed to look like if you're clothed with Jesus. So don't be speechless. Just live like Jesus. Mark chapter 10. You guys should know the passage. James and John come to Jesus and they have but one request. Very simple request. They want to sit at his right and his left in his glory. You know, Jesus never disciples his guys for having that ambition. Some of us think that if you want to be an evangelist or woman mission leader, that's prideful. Who are you to say you want to be a leader in God's church? These guys wanted to sit at his right and his left, and Jesus doesn't disciple him for it. He just says, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what it's going to take. You don't know what my glory is. It's hanging on the cross. And to be at my right and the left is to be on a cross beside me. And you don't know what you're talking about. My glory is to die for the world. Do you have godly ambitions? Do you want to lead? Some of us think that that's like a prideful thing to say. I say, you're prideful because you, you think it's prideful. <laughs> Who are you to say that I want to lead is prideful? God's called me to lead. I want to be a disciple. Oh, that's prideful. What? Being a disciple is being a leader. You're going to go out and seek and save the lost? You're going to lead people to Jesus? That's being a leader. Why is it that I just want to be as effective as I can be? Why is that prideful? Since they got baptized, I wanted to be a preacher, an evangelist, an evangelist, and evangelize and, and to build a church of 10,000. Some, some people say, oh, that's super prideful. But I believe it's calling from God. I don't believe it's by chance that we're here, that God has brought me to where I'm at. Do you have that same conviction? It's okay to want to be at his right and his left in his kingdom. Verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them as their high officials exercise authority over them. Have you ruled like a Gentile? You rule your authority over other people. You use that leadership card. Oh, I'm discipling. You gotta obey your discipler. Obey your obey your leaders. You rule it over people. Well, then you're like a Gentile. Because Jesus says in verse 43, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you, wow. He's saying, dude, if you want to become great among the disciples, do you have that ambition? I want to be great even among the disciples. As Paul told Timothy, you set an example to the believers. You set the example to the disciples, dude. Because you're a leader. You don't be mediocre. You don't just fulfill the minimum. You set the example to the disciples. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. 
And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Oh, whoever wants to be first. Huh. You want to be first? Good. You should. You should run the race as if you're the only one that's going to win. You should run the race as if there's only one winner and you're going to take it. Amongst the disciples. Let's not give in to false humility. Of thinking that, oh, you go ahead, bro. You're much greater than I. No, that should be our attitude. We become less so people can become more. But do you desire to be first? It's okay to have that ambition. But if you do, you must be slave to all. Check this out, guys. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to serve. How is it for you in serving? How is it for you just in serving your roommates? To be first among your roommates, among your household. Are you really a leader? Well, then you've got to be the biggest servant. You see, in the kingdom of God, to be a leader, to be an evangelist or a woman's mission leader, you're not on the top like a pyramid. You're at the bottom of the pyramid. It's flipped upside down. And so you serve everybody. First is your leadership group. Then it's the rest of the church, and then it's not Christians. <coughs> and if you want to be a leader, you serve those who are under you, and then you serve non-Christians. Because that's the top of the pyramid. That's the world. Then it's the disciples. Then it's your leadership group. And then it's you serving everybody. And then Jesus is the tip. The cornerstone. As he served all of us by giving his life as a ransom. Are you clothed with Jesus in being a servant? Or do you try to rule your authority over people? Well, no wonder why you think being first is prideful. No wonder why you think being a leader in God's kingdom is prideful. Because you don't understand what it means to be a leader in God's church. Wow. It's to be so. the biggest servant. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 4. You guys still with me here? Yeah. Revolutionary leaders are clothed with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so you get to also amplify the characteristics that Jesus had in your leadership. To be a revolutionary. In Luke chapter 4. Verse 42. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Hmm. Sometimes you just got to get away. Mm -hmm. Some of us, we don't believe in taking breaks. Mm -hmm. Non-stop, must evangelize, must reach out, must, must keep going. <laughs> keep going. Come follow me. <laughs> And you're just working yourself and it becomes a grind. Yep. What are you doing? That is the most ridiculous, outlandish thing I've ever heard. If Jesus took breaks to go be with God, to be with a solitary place without people around, then who are you not to take breaks? Yep. Sometimes we don't take breaks because we feel guilty because we haven't really been doing the work. goes to a solitary place. We find in Mark chapter 1 verse 35 so he could go pray. He could go and refresh himself. He could go get encouragement from God. Are you a self-motivated leader? Do you get motivated just from your time with God? That's how you get refreshed. You need a break? Go spend it with God. And he will strengthen you. He will send his angels to you to minister to you. While Satan has been tempting you and trying to steal your faith, God replenishes it. And he gives strength to the weary. Is that your quiet times with God? Or is it a duty? The people were looking for him. And when he came to where he was, he, he tried to keep him from leaving them. They tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also. Because that is why I was sent. You see, I don't believe in just staying here in Boston preaching the word the rest of my life. I believe in going to other cities. Wherever God wants to take me. People in this room, we're not going to be together for long. I remember hearing someone say that in Phoenix. And I thought, nah, 
That's, that, yeah, amen. But now we're going to God has taken us to all parts of the world. Do you understand that we're not going to be together for long? That you will be sent out because you are a leader in God's church. That you are called to preach the word of God to wherever God sends you. That's not about just preaching in the city where you're at right now. It's wherever God wants to send you because you believe you've been sent to preach. Look over at John chapter 18. A revolutionary leader. Jesus came to die for us, to seek and save the lost, to serve, to preach the word of God, and to be a king. John chapter 18, verse 37. Are you a king then? Said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born. And for this reason, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Woo! Jesus was born to be king. Hmm. You thought the Lion King came up with that. <laughs> Simba. At the water hole. No, no. It was Jesus. It's the very reason why I came. It's the very reason why I was born was to be a leader in God's church. Do you have that same conviction? The reason why you've even been born is to be a leader in God's church. Don't get distracted by little Haley there. <laughs> Look at Romans chapter 8. Come on, bro, it is awesome. Verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And the church said, Amen. Do you believe this passage? That you've been called to be king with Jesus. Is that not awesome? Is that not fire you want up? Then you're called to be an heir to the throne of God and to be a co-heir with Jesus Christ himself. Who the very reason he came to earth was to be king and to be able to preach the word of God, to serve and to seek and save the lost. Do you have that same conviction? That is your destiny to reign with Jesus. That is why you were born, was to be a leader, a revolutionary leader in God's church. Many are invited, but few are chosen. Even in this room, we invited the whole church. Yet few are chosen. Point number one is you've been called. You've been called. Look over in Genesis chapter one. You guys still with me here? Yeah. Genesis chapter one. You know, sometimes we think that God changes over time. Sometimes we can look at the Old Testament and go, man, God was just so hard lined. He's just killing everybody. And then the New Testament, he's not killing anybody. What, did he get baptized there? What happened? What happened to God? Let me tell you something. God doesn't change. And when he created man, look at what he says. Chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And the church said, Amen. Do you understand that when God created man, he meant for him to be a leader? He meant for him to rule the earth. God hasn't changed. 
In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I've given you the authority to go and tell people they need to be disciples of Jesus and make them into it. I've given you the calling to go and subdue the earth. Not just your hometown. Not just your local community, but the whole world needs to be subdued by Christians. Is that awesome? God hasn't changed from the beginning of creation. Yeah. He's still calling disciples to rule the world. To make disciples of all nations. Point number two is called the greatness. What kind of vision do you have for your life? What type of vision do you have for yourself? Point number two, called the greatness. What type of vision do you have for your life? I'll never forget the first time I met Mandy. August 2nd, 2008. It was at a Jubilee in Los Angeles. I remember being interested in his sister, but gave it to God. The next week I prayed, and I thank God for Mandy being my girlfriend. Then I thank God for Mandy being my wife, and then I thank God for our kids. Now I still gave it to God. I was surrendered if I never talked to Mandy again. Amen. What's your vision for your life? Mm -hmm. I remember getting baptized and believing I'm called to lead church of thousands. That's why I'm in a major city. I could go to a sub, sub town. I could go to the old town I grew up in and build a church. And we'd be fruitful and we'd baptize. But I've been called to build a church of thousands. I believe it. What's the vision for your life? What is God calling you to do? Whether it be in your personal life, getting a good job, having a career. Some of us need to just get careers so we can give them up. <laughs> yeah. Come on. You know what I'm saying? Like ministry should not be a step up for you. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying right there, guys? Yeah. Yeah. You gotta be able to give something up. So yeah. go get something. Come on. So you can give it up. Come on. God blessed me with an awesome job at 20 years old. A medical direct review for pharmacy. Working with people who were in debt up to the ears with degrees, I didn't have any. Getting paid on salary, check coming in every week, full time benefits, paid time off, paid vacation. It was an awesome job. And I gave it up to go on a mission field to start a region of the City of Angels Church. What do you have to give up? Some of us need to get good careers. Mm. We need to get those degrees. And we need to make it happen so that people are willing to look at your life and want to imitate it. So you have a more powerful testimony. Go get your testimony. How about your vision in the ministry? Do you believe you've just been called to be an intern? Oh, I've just been called to be on staff to lead a Bible talk. I've just been called to leave one campus. There's 33 campuses in this city within just a couple miles. We can look out this window and count, not even on both the hands, how many, minute, uh, how many campuses are right there. Those are whole churches, guys. How many are you going to leave? Some of us don't want to put ourselves out there because we know the Chinese proverb that the nail that sticks out gets pounded in. And guess what? You put yourself out as a leader, you will get discipled. But how much do you want to be like Jesus? How much do you want that disciple? Well, it depends by how much you're putting yourself out there. If you're holding back, you're trying to sit in the second, third row, sit in the back even, but that's, that's too shameful, so we sit in the second, third row. That's right, right that middle ground, that lukewarmness that we like. Because no one's going to say that you're cold. And no one's going to try to really step on each other and say you're not hot because they don't really know your full potential. Because you're in a new church, a new city, and no one really knows what you're capable of. And so you just coast. And you get by 
and you settle for being mediocre. That's not a revolutionary leader. A revolutionary leader gives all of its heart. A revolutionary leader gives everything they got. They put themselves forward, and when they fall down, they fall forward. But they keep moving forward. They're not content with being mediocre. They're not content without living out their full destiny. They're not content without being like Jesus because they clothe themselves with Jesus Christ. And so they're co-heirs to the throne of God. And they're not going to settle for anything less. They want to be great. They want to be first. And so they become the biggest servants by preaching the word and seeking and saving the loss. A call to greatness. And you've been called to be a revolutionary leader. Thank you, and to God be all the glory.